Hello, welcome to the women's show. It's me, Chris Brack, and we are sponsored by bookmakers.com. And I'm joined today by Emma Sanders. How are you doing, Emma? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you? Also, I've long time no long time no speak. We've done the show for ages. I oh, know it has been a while. Sorry, I think that's partly my fault because I've just basically been up and down the country most of the time. <laughs> it's just in, just just in demand, aren't you? Up and down. Well, um, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right, so we haven't done these for ages. I think the last time we did one, we were fairly confident the season was going to go well, and then you know, we had sort of running of about five games. So I thought we'll have a bit of a chat about the running. It was a uh, interesting running. Some of the crowd. Yeah. Some, state of some people in the crowd was also quite fun, which I'm sure we'll get into later. But, I mean, the last sort of five games was a bit of a run of, like, two big wins, two big performances, and probably one horror show. It's probably the best yeah. way we could put We could basically put it, is, which was the Brighton win was the massive one, because that kind of almost felt like that, that was pretty much done deal. But it was the yeah. Kerry Holland show. The, the Brighton game was the Kerry Holland show. It was a bit of the Kerry Holland season, to be fair. But, you know, she does what she does best. Big games, big goals. And that's kind of been her mantra all season is, when, when we've needed it, she, uh, she's brought the goals to us. And with the addition of Fuka, she is able to get forward more now, which is great because it frees her up. And then Fuka just pick, pick her passes out. Yeah, well, like you say, it was. It was just such a good performance, that from, from the midfield in particular. Um, but I think, yeah, the timing of it, it was just, it was one of those where it was just win at all costs, really, just get it over the line. I don't think... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've consistently said I, I've never feared that we've ever been in any real danger in terms of relegation, but mathematically, you know, Liverpool were for a while. So, um, yeah, just to kind of get it all confirmed and get it sorted out with, you know, with games to spare, I think I think was, yeah, was just great. So to be able to get the win against the team, obviously, in, in that kind of relegation battle was needed. So, yeah, it was a big performance against Brighton, big result. And, uh, and obviously, I'm sure we'll come on to this in a minute, but... I think there was, uh, yeah, another big result that followed it. There was, there was. Um, we did have, we'll talk about the City one in a minute, but then we sort of, so the Brighton one was a bit like, it was literally who was left fit because um, we were like struggling for players. Yeah. Like, we, can't, we can't deny it, you know, we, I think um, we had no Raza Roberts with concussion. Nephi missed quite a lot of the running due to a, a calf injury. Uh, so it was, a, it felt, the next game felt like a bit of a game too far for the amount of injuries we had, but that's probably the one concern we've got. Is we've had a couple, not many, but a couple of those performances where you've just gone, I don't know what's going on. And it was it was four yeah. nil to Leicester. I'll be honest, it could have been six or seven. It generally could have been another Man United seven six nil. It was a bit of a bit of a wake up call. And I think the manager, I think the ma- it's good for the manager because he's like, well, we're safe, but I've got something to work on. And it's it's an an element of the team that we just need to eradicate a little bit, which is. No one can be perfect every week, but we can't have it drop to that level where, you know, Leicester have done the double overs. Now, listen, Leicester post Christmas have been excellent, hence why they stayed up. Yeah. Um, but you should be losing 4 0 at home, away from home, sorry. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, you say you shouldn't lose 4 0 away from home, but, you know, they also lost at home. Um, so um, it wasn't that it was just, it was one big, you know, horror show against Leicester. It was the fact that, you know, dropped dropped six points against Leicester as well, which I think was even mm. worse. But yeah, I think personally in the in the week building up to the to the Leicester game, I didn't feel like the messaging was right coming out coming out of the club. It felt like a bit of complacency had crept in. That was just my personal opinion. And obviously hindsight's a beautiful thing. But um yeah, I did I did think at the time, you know, mathematically there's still work to be done and I wasn't particularly kind of happy with with the fact that you know there was perhaps a lot of a lot of comfort and I get you know you want to be confident and you want to play with creativity and you want to take the shackles off a little bit but I think when there's a job to be done still um I think that has to be kind of in the focus and I didn't really feel like it was so I have to admit I wasn't overly surprised by the performance yes I was surprised by the result but I wasn't overly surprised by the performance because I just yeah I just felt that yeah maybe there was a little bit of complacency and and like you say, I think there was a couple of those performances where perhaps in the championship last season, Liverpool could afford to to cruise a little bit, if you like. Um, but you can't do that in the WSL. There's absolutely no no room for that. You get punished. But, you know, the gap in quality is so different. Um, yeah. So I just think I think that was another one of those those lessons. And yeah, perhaps the fact that a lot of players have had to play on maybe through niggling injuries, obviously, mm players who perhaps haven't haven't been used to playing as many minutes or have as much responsibility have obviously had to shoulder a lot of that due to injuries elsewhere in the squad. You know, you look at somebody like Katie Stengel, who's kind of been the focal point all season up front. 
you think, yeah, I just think there was maybe a few tired minds as opposed to kind of tired legs out there by, by the time the Leicester game came round. But, you know, that's obviously no excuse. Um, and, and that's something that they'll be filled on next season. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, I mean, but then we sort of kicked off because so we, we had City, Man City at home. And let's be honest, we're all thinking we're, we're getting battered for no man Leicester. <laughs> this, this City game is going to be entertaining. Um, I'll be honest, though, it was probably the best performance I've seen from us at home. Yeah, um, they I were agree. At, they were at City and they were pressing them. And City liked to pass it around at the back. I'm not certain all their players are comfortable with that style of play, but that's the style they want to go with. And they, they pounced on it uh, with Tash Dowie get, getting a goal. Um, City pegged one back, um, which I felt that goal was coming. You know, Faye Kirby, you know, was getting very busy. Yeah. Um, but the winning goal from Missy Bowe, just a great, great team goal. Uh, Emma Coy Vista, uh, I've basically said, and I don't mean to disparage this, she, she's like the female Steve Finnan. Yeah. Just consistent all game, every game. You yeah. know what you're going to get to 7 out of 10 all the time. And nice goal by Missy Bowe. And then me not being in the best of health, which we'll come into later, and 11 minutes added time really could I could have done without. I mean, there's an yeah. absolute <laughs> wonder save by Faye in the last couple of minutes, which if you haven't seen it, it's worth a watch because it is onto yeah. the bar and just off the line. It's a, it's a great save. Great experience for her. I, I think she's... I think Faye's had... The, the, the full experience now of being a WSL player. She had the highs of Chelsea away, City at home, and then she had the reality check of you can't make a, you can't make a, a basic error, which will come into the Villa game, which she did get caught out for. But again, she's only youngster. But is that a slight concern for Liverpool that maybe the, a little bit of over reliance on a youngster because she, she's getting ahead of Eartha Cummings, who is a very experienced goalkeeper. Yeah, I don't think it's a concern because I'm sure we'll come on to this, but uh, I, I, I do I do think we'll see a new goalkeeper in, in a few weeks. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I've already put it out there anyway, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that we'll have another one in the door um, by the Australian name of uh, Tegan Micah. So, um, yeah, I think I think they'll be adding numbers to that department anyway. So, no, to answer your question bluntly, I'm not concerned. Um, I actually think the opposite. I think I wasn't really expecting Faye and yeah, nothing against her, just more because she was a bit of an unknown. I wasn't really expecting her to kind of develop as quickly as she has throughout the season. And um, yeah, obviously going into, you know, her debut, there was a lot of really good talk coming out of the club about how impressed they were in training and yeah, how she'd maybe, like you say, jumped up the pecking order. Um, I was obviously completely blown away when I saw her and I thought, okay, well, um, I can see why people are, are excited about her. Um but yeah, sure, she's got a lot of developing to do. Um, but I think Matt Beer threw, threw her in at the deep end to see how she would deal with those situations. And I think on the whole, yeah. you know, she, you know, she did very well. So um, yeah, I don't think it's necessarily a, a, a bad thing to be reliant upon a younger player. But as I say, I don't actually expect Liverpool will be reliant on <laughs> a younger player. Well, such a younger player next season. Yeah, I mean, if you've got to throw a young player, this is the best time to do it. Yeah, you know when, when you know your math has to say it. Not that the games don't matter, but it's competitive football. Without the well, if it does cost us the game, it's not going to relegate us. It's just you can live and learn from it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, it was really good because I mean, you know, this Man City. I mean, I think that's the that is the first time we've beaten Man City since we played them at Chester last yeah. time in WSL. I think that was under Scott under Scott Rogers. So we're yeah. talking a good five years, good five plus years ago that we've beaten Man City. So again, I think. You know, Matt Bain needs a lot of credit. There's been a there's been a year of a few firsts, you know, beating Man City, beating Chelsea. I can't remember the last time we beat Chelsea. I think all the years I've been following women's football, um, going to the games, which is now getting to about seven, eight years. I don't think I've seen us beat Chelsea. I think the last yeah. time we beat Chelsea was probably when we last won the title. So yeah. these are sort of things where you can't take them for, these are the, the right steps in the right direction, which is being competitive against the, the big teams, which is something we probably weren't last time in, in the WSL, which is the concern. Uh, the Villa game was just a mad 3-3. Three, three. Uh, Rachel Daly just kept scoring. I think some of our goals were considered soft, but I think the, the goal, the uh, the second goal from for, uh, from Stengel is a great team goal. You know, yeah, understand that finally yeah, fit the cross she puts in, and it's a great header. So I mean, yeah. nine goals this year from Stengel. I, I don't know where we'd be without her, to be honest. Um, I just hope she gets a bit of support next year because that poor woman has been absolutely like a battering ram. And she's not had much support behind her because the other option got, unfortunately, have picked up horrendous injuries as we keep picking up nickels. So you're, you're kind of hoping she gets a bit of support next year, but she's been brilliant for us. 
Yeah, she has. And yeah, I will definitely be talking about her more later because of a question that you're going to ask me later. Um, so I won't okay. give away all of my cards. But um, yeah, in terms of her overall impact on the team, I think, yeah, it, it goes without saying. Obviously, goals are the hardest thing to do in football and she's provided them consistently throughout the season. And, she, and she's provided, you know, that number of goals in a team that's kind of in the bottom, bottom half of the table. And when you talk about that Villa game, um, yeah, it was a bit of a mad free all, but technically Villa kind of had nothing really to play for. So they could mm -hmm. play in a way, I think that almost plays into their hands because they can just attack and not really think too much about it. And they, you know, they had the player of the season and the WCL Golden Boot winner in their team. So if you give Rachel Daly one chance, she's going to score it. Um, we've seen that consistently throughout the season. So, um, yeah, I don't think conceding three to them is, you know, is 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 it any kind of shame. Um, we've seen them dispatch teams and score goals. So, oh, yeah. Um, to, to, yeah, to let in those goals, but then keep coming back and, and keep scoring and keeping with them, I think is is almost as impressive as um, as the wins against Chelsea and Man City. Like, don't get me wrong in terms of, like, the mathematical kind of advantage that you get from those wins and the actual impacts of the, of the results against those teams were much bigger. But just purely in isolation, if you look at the performances, um, they're, they're all very, very different performances. Obviously, like you said, the Man City one, it was taking the game to Man City and really stamping their authority against against a big, you know, a big four club. Um, Chelsea, it was all about the tactical now. Um, I thought Matt Beard was incredible in both Chelsea games, the way that he set the team up, worked down to a tee both times really got Emma Hayes' number in those games. And then the Villa game was completely different again because it, I think that was down to the players and, and as I say, sort of the resilience and the mentality to, to kind of stay in the game and keep coming back and keep offering something different and learning throughout the 90 minutes as well, um, finding the spaces and finding how to break down that, you know, what has been a very, very good Villa defence as well. Um, so yeah, I was actually really pleased with that, even though it was a bit of an absolutely yeah. bonkers game. Um, I just think at that stage of the season, yeah, there, yeah, there wasn't really anything to play for, and and yet both teams, um, you know, as I say, it wasn't just Villa. Uh, I think Liverpool did it as well. Both teams found something within themselves to to deliver a performance that I think both fans would have enjoyed and would have been pretty proud of. Yeah, I mean, if we're being honest, in the twenty two games we've played this year, you will probably say there's only been three where you've gone. They've been absolutely not turned up, outplayed. In yeah. every other one, which is probably Everton at home, United away, and probably like Leicester away. I think in all yeah. the other games, while they may not have won them or got the results we wanted, they've always kept themselves 20 minutes to go, there's still a chance they can get something out. There's still something to build on here. Which, yeah. again, is a, is a stepping stone for where we want the put to be, which is to push higher up, higher up the leagues. But to do that, you've got to keep yourself in games. Which, when you look at the teams who, are, who finish below us, you know, we're talking... West Ham had a really good season last year. Tottenham have spent big. Brighton and then Reading, who've been a, a mainstay in WSL. You know, they've probably had too many of those three or four game periods where you've just gone like, they just don't look coherent. And it's just been like walk over, walk over, walk over. And I think that's the, the challenge Bristol will find for it is just keep yourself in the game, which is the big thing. Yeah, and I think there's a tendency as well. And, you know, and this isn't a criticism of, of anyone. I think, you know, as Liverpool fans, obviously, we're very privileged to have seen success both on the men's and women's side. So I think naturally and rightly so, expectations are high. And I don't think we should ever lose that as a fan base. But um, I do think there's there's a tendency that, um, yeah, perhaps because of the the highs of the past that, yeah, maybe people expected Liverpool to, to just slot back into the WSL and it would be very easy. Um, and they've made it look that way, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it's not easy in the slightest for for a red for a team that's just been promoted um, to to finish comfortably mid table at the end of a WSL season. I actually think is extremely impressive. Um, and you know you actually look back across the season and you're right in terms of those they, they those three games that you picked out in terms of the results that were real horror shows. They were the only three that I picked out as as the horror shows. But I do think there was a couple of games that were near misses. Um, yeah. yeah. That you know, you look at like obviously the Leicester one nil. I think there was a three or draw with Reading. Um, was there a one or draw with Brighton just before yeah. Christmas as well? Yeah, it was a three. And, the, the Brighton was like a three three because it was the oh, third last minute header. But the, I think it's like we lost one nil at home to Tottenham, which or the one on yeah. the way to Tottenham, which is a weird game because you went at half time one nil down going, well, look, it's one nil down here. 
and you yeah. finished the game going, have we not won this? Yeah. Was, well, well, there's a lot of that, and that was that was the big thing for the away games is we got some decent draws, credible draws, you know, probably unlucky not to win against Everton. Um, yeah. Some very strange officiating. Yeah. yeah. But you're looking going, that's probably the, the big thing for next year is trying yeah, to turn some of those away performances into wins. Because home form-wise, Liverpool's home form was up there with some of the best. You know, they don't yeah. lose many at home, to be fair. And the ones they do are always tight, like the United one, which was... The pleasing thing about the United one was, although we lost, which is not great, because you don't want to lose, but they didn't win the league, which is obviously a big plus. But it's a big occasion, big game, big game of the BBC. And I kind of felt when we had the big game on Sky for the Everton game, you kind of went, oh, it's not really... We've not really turned up to this. The occasion's got to us a little bit. And all the yeah. talk was about... Are you going to stop United win the league? What's going to go on? You know, are we going to perform against United? And to be fair to the team, they stepped up, but it was just like a, it's a one 0 loss. It was honest where you could take a lot of positives from Rachel Laws, who had been dropped out squad for a little bit for Fake Kirby, came back in, produced two brilliant saves. Uh, the one against yeah. Nikita Paris is excellent. You know, yeah. and you're looking back going on another day, you can you can see Liverpool get nicking a goal. You know, but this is a Man United side that was pretty free scoring. You know, they don't not yeah. they don't off they normally score more than one to keep them quite. Quite, I thought it was a big, it was a big uh, plus for Liverpool. Yeah, absolutely, and that's sort of what I'm getting at in terms of like next season. It, it's it's those fine margins that I think, and and that's something that comes over time. You know, mm-hmm. the fact that Liverpool have in one season basically um, pretty much got themselves familiar with the WSL, and I think we'd worked out you know the WSL within two three months, which I think is very very impressive actually. Um, mm-hmm. So to then be in a point where going into your second season, you're then looking at you know, the fine margins and turning those, like you say, those um, decent performances into a point or a point into a draw, uh, sorry, a point into into a win. And then obviously, you know, just improving on that waveform. Um, yes, other teams each year are going to improve as well. But I think for that as a, as a standpoint, and yeah, so it was almost like full circle where we started the season as that complete unknown, shocking the big the big club mm-hmm. and then we're brought very much back down to earth you know a few few weeks later at, at Anfield against against Everton um and then you come full circle again and then you finish finish the you know the season yes with a defeat but a far more assured performance arguably than the one against Chelsea um it was just like you say it was it was just the result was different so um yeah I'm look I'm 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 feeling really really positive af- after the season I think when you look at it overall Yes, you can pick out things to improve on for sure. Um, and yeah, there will be a few concerns in certain certain areas, but mm. ev- every club will have those. Unless unless you're a Chelsea where you win in the league every year, um, every club will, will have areas of concern. And, and yeah, I think I think that performance against Man United to end to end the season, yes, despite the result, I thought was um yeah, was was a pretty positive one. Yeah, I thought so. Um, so in terms of as we said, mission accomplished. I think you and me had a conversation off air, probably beginning of the season, to how many points you think we'll need. And I think we sort of looked at what the average was. I said the average is 14, keeps you up. So we said, but I think between we said, if you get 20 points, you're comfortably up. You don't need to worry about oh, anything yeah. else. So, yeah. so 23 is like, well, that's more the return than, than we expected. And to be fair, I don't think many new WSL sides are getting 20 plus points in the first season. I think Absolutely maybe Man United. Not. I think maybe Man United in the first season backing probably got slightly higher. But other than that, there aren't yeah. many in the first season doing that. So, again, it's, it's a building block. You know, we all want to, as, as Neil talks about, we want to see Liverpool winning European trophies and winning to do yourself. That's the dream. That's what you want. Yeah. You've got to do the baby steps on the way. And I think this has been, a, not a baby I think it's been quite a big jump. And I think yeah. it's just yeah, that expectation. So, mission accomplished. Um, we'll talk about play of the season because I know you're dying to talk mm-hmm. about uh, someone for play of the season. Because you may always have this debate. So, who was your player of the season then? Well, I've done a couple of podcasts actually, and um, and it's actually changed from my first one. And I've said this, so like I think actually I don't think I said it publicly, but I voted um, for Kerry Holland actually as my player of the season. Like when the season was quite raw, and yeah, and I, I'm a I'm a huge sort of um, yeah cheerleader for like the underdogs, and I really like the kind of the defensive midfielder or the box to box midfielder type role. Um, so basically the type of player that Kerry Holland is absolutely appeals to me. Um, I think she's been unbelievable this season. I think she's been absolutely crucial to the, um, yeah, to Liverpool's sort of return to the WSL. And I think, you know, we really missed her when, when she was out injured, but actually, um, 
you know, when I actually took a bit of a step back and maybe a few weeks later to look back at the whole season and really took it in. Um, and actually, I was swayed a little bit by Neil Atkinson. <laughs> um, Neil Atkinson's favourite player, to be fair. Yeah, but I have, but rightly so, I think, you know, I, I, I have, I have, you know, readdressed it. And I think it, it was always very tight between Katie Stengel and Kerry Holland. But, but yeah, I've, I, I now think it's it's right to say that, you know, Kate, Kate Stengel was player of the season because, as I say, her goal scoring form is up there with, yeah, with, with sort of the, the top half of the WSL. And she's doing that with far, far fewer chances. She's scoring big goals against big teams as well. Um, obviously scoring, what was it, three against Chelsea in the end across, across the two games. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I just think she's she's had to do that, like you say, sort of shouldering a lot of responsibility on her own. It was her first season in the WSL as well. Um, I just think, yeah, what what she gives, she holds the ball up well, she's got strength, um, she takes her shots early, she's a proven goal scorer, and she's just got a really, really hardcore mentality. So um, I, I, for me, I think if you take away her goals, I would worry as to where Liverpool might be. So, um, yeah, she's got to be player of the season, I think. Yeah, I'm still sticking with me, mate. I still think it's Kerry Holland. <laughs> uh, but it, I'm like you. I was a bit like between the two. So it went, oh, it's yeah. Kate Stengel. I go, oh, fair enough. I'm not exactly. gonna... It wasn't, it was like, you know, like, wow, that's wild. It was like, it's one of... yeah. for me, I sort of feel it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but I kind of feel Kerry Holland is the bit of the system. I yeah. kind of just feel whatever formation we play, it's just like, well, Kerry can do that. Kerry can do that. Kerry can do that. And everyone else can work around it. I kind of feel when she's not there, I just think it takes away from a lot of other players' games because I think not many of us could do what she can do. Um, yeah. I kind of call her a bit like a, she's a bit like a one elder. Doesn't matter we play her holding role, attacking role, wide wide forward. It just works. Doesn't matter yeah. where you put it. It just works. I do think that that rapport with her and Fuka is key. I just wonder for next season if we need a more defensive minded person next to. Them to Partly free Kelly a bit more and take a bit of pressure off Fuka because the one thing with the Leicester loss, I thought Leicester tactically did really well getting two banks of four either side of Fuka, so she had nothing to get, nothing to hit. Yeah. As soon as she gets her head up, you know, she can find anywhere. I thought that's the thing I think teams will work out, are starting to work out or trying to work out is trying to block, trying to get a box around Fuka because then yeah. it kind of cuts off a lot of avenues because she's such a clever use of the ball. Yeah. So, that's the kind of thing where I mean in terms of young players, you know, I thought Missy Bow had a really good I think it was for her, it was a really good developer. I felt she found the beginning of WSL so a bit of a challenge. It's a you know, yep. it's a big step up. She's a young player. We were sometimes playing as a midfield too, which I don't think plays to her strengths. But like all good players, she finds a way, she developed, she had, had a lot more goals to her game. Second half season because she felt more comfortable again. She had Fuka Piano a bit more of a, a set uh set aside. I thought Taylor Hines on the whole did really well. You know, she's been asked to be as a stepping captain. First season back in the WSL because she only played a little bit for Everton. Um, I do feel sometimes perhaps, perhaps we need to, to have, have some cover behind her because I think sometimes she's overplayed. Not because she's not a good player. I just think in general, you could probably see in the season a bit of tiredness because she's our main left back. And the other option for left back is swapping Kobe Vista over there and then trying to find a right back. I feel that's probably where we need a bit of cover is someone who can just take a bit of pressure off both full backs. Yeah, I actually... Um... Yeah, I, I I did think Taylor Taylor Hines struggled this season. Actually, I, I'll be honest. I I had her as probably a player that um, I was perhaps a little bit disappointed with. But um, yeah, I, I, maybe I'm being a bit harsh because, like you say, she hasn't had that many minutes in in the WSL. But I think her levels in the Championship were so exciting, um, mm. especially last season. That yeah, I think she lacks lacks consistency this year, and she just looked a little bit off the pace. So. I do, I do think she, yeah, she perhaps struggled against, um, yeah, probably against against the more intelligent forwards. Um, you look at like obviously, and I think that is the big difference. Is that in the championship you haven't you haven't got quality players like like your Sam Kerr and yeah, mm-hmm. obviously your Pernell Harders that you're going to meet up against um, Chelsea. Obviously Harders not there anymore, but um, yeah, I I just think. I think that that was where perhaps her weaknesses were exploited a little bit. She was struggling a little bit in terms of the yeah maybe maybe the pace of the game and also her positioning wasn't quite right. So she I felt she was getting caught out a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think I think next season we we do certainly need some cover there because perhaps that's one of the reasons why is that she's not really had any competition in terms of that fullback role. So um, mm-hmm. it must be hard for her to kind of develop her role when 
when yeah, she's not really kind of got anyone going up against her um, and providing real sort of real competition. So yeah, I've, I, that's that's definitely an area that I'd like to see Liverpool invest in in, in the summer. Um, and yeah, I just I just hope we get some get a couple couple. I'd I'd take two fullbacks to be honest, but um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, at least one for sure. Yeah, so we'll sort of talk about what we need to kick on, but I think we may as well talk about transfers because it's that time of the year. Everyone, everyone likes to talk yeah. about transfers. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the outs. I mean, the manager said he's looking to bring five to seven in. That's what he's. That's the, the last quote he did, which yeah. kind of makes sense because we've had one, two, three, four, five, seven players leave the club, mm-hmm. which for those who aren't familiar with women's football, it, it's a sad norm, unfortunately, in women's football is most players only have one to two year contracts and for squad clubs, there is quite a big turnover of players. You know, yeah. it's not it's not as common a place we see in the men's game where it's three, four year contracts. So that also can make building squads difficult. And that's sometimes where you see like some clubs go up and down quite dramatically because you know one one wrong sum and it really can have a dramatic effect. In terms of the outs, was that sort of any big surprises? Any sort of like going, oh, I thought that was bad. the one that probably surprised me was Meg Campbell, as in I think everyone assumed. A contract decision would be the just way of getting it done because she's had a good season. You know, she's defensively really good. She also does give you that cover at left back to you know, give her and Hines that, but she could play centre uh, centre back as well. But a little surprised that that just didn't really materialise in the end, and she's uh, sadly moving on. The question always around Meg is probably a knee injury. Yeah, I mean, I was perhaps slightly surprised when I first heard it. Um... Yeah, I, I can't remember what time I, I maybe reported it, but it was it was definitely before I think the kind of the transfer window really kicked in. So mm. I hadn't really heard too much in terms of what was maybe perhaps coming in. So when I heard it, yeah, I was maybe more I was slightly surprised because um yeah, I, I like you say she she provides that fullback cover. Um but yeah, I wouldn't say I was shocked because I do think obviously um I think partly Liverpool's problem and I think you're right in terms of the contracts but actually I think that is maybe starting to change sort of the last year or two um I think Liverpool are probably starting to go more the way of you know where it's two two three year contracts but I think the, the problem has been is that there's been obviously quite a bit of a, an aging squad over the last couple of years so I think that's mm-hmm. what Matt is trying to do he's maybe trying to phase it out and in that sense you know there has to come a point where where you start to offload players who are who are perhaps at a certain age or getting into that bracket um, and just refreshing the squad now and again. And um, Meg Campbell's position, the fact that she was, um, you know, not a nailed on starter, I think makes sense for that to be one of those positions that, that you transition out of. And actually when, yeah, when I've heard about kind of the the players that we might be bringing in or the ones that we've been targeting, I can see how it makes sense now because mm-hmm. um, yeah, it looks like they're probably going to bring in, you know, a similar player, but again, of a, a much younger sort of, age range so and like you say the injuries has obviously played a part and as far as I'm, I'm aware I think in January the plan was to to actually probably keep um well certainly offer Meg Campbell um another contract and then as the season went on and again those injuries were kind of there thereabouts I think Matt Beard probably realised that yeah he needs probably a bit more of a consistent squad depth and and that means yeah like I say maybe getting in players who are who are available and haven't perhaps got the same injury concerns but yeah it's it, it's it's a real shame for Meg Campbell, I think. And on a personal level, I think I probably would have kept her for another year. Um, mm-hmm. But I can understand the thinking around it. I think I think the main the main shot for me, um, I think I think all of the other outgoings, to be honest, are pretty much expected. Um, the the one for me, I was I was slightly surprised about was actually was was Riley. Um, I did I did think we would we would probably give her give her another year. But again, mm-hmm. obviously since then, um, yeah, it sounds like we're getting in. At, we're getting another keeper in so um yeah it, it sort of makes sense now um so on the whole that yeah I don't think I'm overly surprised to be honest yeah so I mean for those who don't know the other players left was a uh, Liam Robe who was a level for five years over 100 appearances Raza Roberts who was there for five years both good really good defenders both can cover multiple positions good squad options probably aren't getting the minutes that they want so yeah. and I think at the at the I think Robe's 29 I think Raz is a similar age. They want to play regular, regular, regular football. So I can kind of understand why they've been allowed to to move on, so they can get more regular football. I, I'll be surprised if WCL clubs aren't looking around them. Uh, Carla Humphreys kind of makes sense because um, she just has barely played in the two years we've had her. It just it's yeah. one of those moves. 
made sense at the time. It just hasn't worked out. Yeah, it you just know, hasn't it, worked out. It, it just ha happens. And Fernie had already gone in January on loan to Bristol City, so we kind of expected just that to contract to run out. Uh, I'm assuming she's signing with Bristol anyway. So yeah, yeah, she signed she signed another year at Bristol. So yeah, so that would kind of make sense. And then with your extensions, uh, Jazz Matthews for two more years. Yarn has got another year, and uh, Captain Nifa he's got an another year. So yeah. He's, he's had a bit of experience, but it says, what do we need? I think we both agree we probably need at least one fullback, maybe two, for a bit of pressure. Bit of pressure. Yeah. Pro probably looking at central defence and, and defensive midfield. But we, yeah. we probably do need at least one, maybe two forwards because we've got no Mel Lawley out until November. Yeah. And I do you think the concern is there's a bit of lack of pace out wide because Shanice Van Sant's been brilliant when she's played. Uh, but again, she's, she's struggled a little bit with, with injuries. And we can't expect Kate Stengel to do another 22 games with hardly any other options to help her out. And the hope is Leanne Keener comes back from her injury unscathed. But, you know, yeah. a year out of a big injury is quite, you know, it's going to take a time to get, just get up to match sharpness, let alone get used to WSL football. Yeah, well, and th this is the interesting thing is that I think there's several factors here. Like you say, Mal Lawley is not available until until later on in, in sort of the first part of the season. So, um, yeah, my understanding is that it looks like we're going to bring in a Sheffield United striker, Mia Enderby, who's a really, really, really good young player, um, which I personally think is probably cover cover for Mel actually in the first half of the season because obviously she's not a player that you would expect to be starting, um, mm -hmm. but just adds a little bit of depth and I think maybe just covers that. Obviously, as you say, you know, you hope that you've got Kiernan back. Um, so alongside Stengel and Van der Sanden, if we can keep those three fit, I think that would be, you know, a very, very exciting front three in the WSL. Um but yeah, all, all of the talk. Um, and I think Liverpool's main main priority actually in this window, apart from getting those defenders in who I'm who I believe they're pretty confident that they've got over the line now. It's yeah, it's trying to get that striker. Um, and they might have actually got one down um in the last couple of weeks. But yeah, they've they've certainly been looking at a lot of them. Um, about four or five names have come my way. So yeah, they're definitely after a striker. I think certainly, as you say, to add that support for Stengel. So um, yeah, and I also think that's probably why Yana's been given another year, um, just because, yeah, just to she's add it She's very versatile because she can cover fullback, she can cover wide midfield. She gives yeah. you, it's, every squad needs a player like that who can just do a bit of everything because it's just handy yeah. to have, you know. Yeah, and, and she stepped up to the plate this year. She had a lot of responsibility and, you know, she was performing consistently well. She obviously stayed fit for a lot of it. So I think, mm -hmm. yeah, when you've got a player like that who's, Who's content with their role, and yeah, that you know they, they don't have to be starting every week. Um, I think I think it's only right to, to kind of yeah reward that, and like you say, it it can be an asset. So um, yeah, I'd like to see a fullback in a, a, a CDM and a, probably two attacking players, one a winger, um, and if that's me or Enderby, then I'd like to see yeah quite a big sort of centre forward coming in. I, I think we need some real quality up front. So. Yeah, that's sort of my wish list. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I don't really need too much, but I think, yeah, I'd be happy with with four or five signings to be honest. So any more than that is, yeah, is, is a bit of a bonus, I think. Good, good. good. And sort of outside the Liverpool bubble, you know, there's there is obviously talks. You know, a lot of players sort of go to Spain. Uh, Russo, the uh, the Man United or the former yeah. Man United striker, seems to be attracting interest from Arsenal. Yeah, uh, so it, into Arsenal. Yeah. Yeah, so it's an interesting one because didn't didn't Arsenal. Put a world record fee in for it, and then got yeah. turned down to get it for nothing. I can't yeah. understand why United didn't want to do it. Cause it probably sends out the wrong message, which is we'll go for a title and we're going to sell our best striker. So I, I can't understand it, but it was you know big money move for for her. She's a very good you know. Listen, she's excellent. Having seen her up close um, at, at the the home game, you can see why a lot of clubs are after her because she's yeah brilliant. yeah. Well, Arsenal have been trying to get her in for for years now. So um, yeah, obviously United knowing that they had a real big chance to go for the title and qualify for Europe. Yeah, they didn't want to get rid of her. And and you could argue that, it, you know, it technically has paid off because, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they haven't got, you know, half a million in, but um, but they've got Champions League football and and they were obviously finished runners-up. They didn't quite get the title. So, um, yeah, they, they would say that they made the right decision. But, um, and I think, I think really all along, they, they were probably hoping that, that Alessio was going to sign a new contract. So, Personally, mm. I I think they've lost her, um, and and they and they might have made a mistake in in January by not taking that money because they could have then reinvested that in a, in a top class striker now. Whereas, 
yeah, now now they're kind of going to be playing second fiddle, I think, to some of Europe's biggest clubs in the transfer market. So, um, and, and yeah. There is so good for one of the other strikers not being particularly happy either. Um, oh, his name escapes me. Um, oh, and it will come back to me. But I think another <laughs> man, I've, seen, I've seen a link today saying they're also not happy. They also might be moving on. So could be quite big changes for Man United, especially if, you know, into Europe, you kind of want a consistent squad going into... I think it's my it's first season in Europe, so they kind of yeah. get used to that whole balance of Europe and WSL, which, look, it took Chelsea a couple, couple of years to do it, and, and Chelsea squad's massive. Yeah. And, but, and even and even then, they find that, you know, they do know it's a challenge to get that balance. Yeah, well, that's it. And Chelsea's a great example is that they've built squad depth over a period of time. So hmm. um, they've retained their key players and their star players while adding to it each summer. Um and Arsenal have started to do that as well over the last couple of years. Obviously, they managed to keep Miedemar last year, which was which was a massive one. Unfortunately, she, she obviously suffered that ACL injury, but um, that was more a show of intent. You know, they did it with Beth Mead a few years ago, did it yeah, with yeah. Um, They've retained all of their big players this summer as well. Kim Little, another massive one. Um, and that's, that's where United have fallen short at the moment. And we've seen how that's impacted City. City lost a lot of their players last summer missed out on Champions League football this year. So, um, yeah, United, while they've made that huge jump to get into that those European positions, um, the problem is when you then put your players on a pedestal and they attract the attention of Europe's best, you've got to be able to keep hold of them and then build on that. The second you start losing those star players, it makes it 10 times harder. So, um, yeah, look, United, will they will have players coming in. Um, I've no doubt. Yeah, they absolutely will have players coming in. It's just whether or not, they're going to be of the same quality and whether or not they're going to be able to slot in immediately um, and, again, take take them to another level because it's not just staying at that level. They, they, no. they need to go up a, a, another one next season and that's that's where I think they, they might struggle. Cool. So the other big news is um, Liverpool women are going to be moving into Melwood. So yeah. the club have, club have agreed to, have, to get Melwood back. Look, hindsight's 2020, but at the time it felt... It didn't feel a great decision to let it go. Yeah. Um, so, but now the fact that women have got their own training facilities, you know, Melwood is iconic. It's so it'll be top of the race training facilities. That can only be a positive sign for for the women and help them help us develop a squad. It'd be great for the, the young players because that's a way of developing up through the system. Yeah. And it's a, a bit of a it's more of a show of intent from Liverpool that you know has been accused in the past that they're not taking it seriously, but they are. You know, this is a sign that they are. So it's definitely a, a big, big step in the right direction. Yeah, and I think rightly so. There's been a lot of criticism of them, of them in the past, and you, you're right in saying that. And I think um, the only way for a, for a club like Liverpool to to learn from from those 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 criticisms and yeah, the the harsh lessons, and it was harsh because yeah, mm. um, they went they didn't do things right, and and they suffered relegation. Um, but I think it's then only right to then praise it when when they're starting to turn things around, which they have done over the last um, eighteen months or so. You know, probably two years now. Um, and this is this is a big big step. I think this is massive news. Um, I actually think it was maybe uh, kind of under under celebrated in a way because because it almost took too long for it to happen. Um, yeah. People were kind of saying better late than never. But actually, um, yeah, I I personally think yes, it is better late than never. But um, but it is still massive that it that it's happening. Um, there's going to be elite facilities. Um, you've got players like you said, the academy are going to be there. So you've now got a player pathway to the first team, which perhaps hasn't been there before. Um, training schedules are now going to be completely on on Matt Beard's terms. You know, it's not a case of having to revolve around other teams or pitch availability or whatever. It's um, if he wants a team in immediately for recovery or for for training or for tactical um, discussions, whatever it might be, um, it's theirs. Um, and I think that will make a big difference. It will create a professional elite environment. Um, and also in the transfer window as well. When when you're, when you're trying to bring new players to a club and you look around and you've got clubs like Brighton who have got elite facilities, clubs like you know Tottenham who are building elite facilities. Um, Leicester, Leicester, big facilities. Leicester, as well. Leicester, who've got elite facilities. A club like Liverpool... Um, that is a massive, massive, massive club, um, has to have elite facilities. And the fact that those three clubs that we've just named have, have basically had a bigger pull in terms of the transfer market than Liverpool because they've got better facilities, I think is a real, real shame. 
Um, mm. So I, I think it's massive now that the yeah a club with a brand um, and the name of, of local FC um, now has a, a training facility that I think is befitting of a of a team representing them. Cool. Just before we go on to what's going on in the summer, um, where the manager Matt Beard because. We are in the world of social media, and look, we can't deny it. Everyone has their opinion, but yeah. do you feel sometimes he's been a bit underappreciated for what he's done absolutely. this year? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As as I said before, I think, um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a tendency, and like I said, you know, I don't want to criticise anyone, but I think there's there's a tendency for expectations to be quite high because of the club that local are, and and yeah, and I don't think that I don't think that should change. Um, but I think, yeah, I think when you actually put it into perspective, and and what Liverpool have managed to do this season, and um, how sort of matter of fact Matt Beard's gone about his business. Yes, he hasn't been without faults, and I've criticised him throughout the season in certain decisions and th- certain things. Um, but I think, yeah, I think for him to take the team that's actually been very injury hit and to and to comfortably survive in the first season in in the WSL, um, yeah, I, I I think is a, is a really good achievement. And um, yeah, I think I think yeah. next season it's just. It's whether or not he can. He's obviously, like I say, I think he he did well tactically against some teams, and I think he didn't do very well against other teams. Um, mm-hmm. So I think I think it's just about him perhaps learning as well, and uh, and just making sure he doesn't make the same mistakes that that he did this season. But yeah, on the whole, I think I think he's done a really good job. Yeah, I mean, sure, I appreciate it. Is um, he was a, a president of Liverpool Women's Supporters Club events where he was they've entered him into a hall hall of fame along with yeah. Tash Dowie. Yeah. And uh, Gemma Bonner in the, the current squad, so kind of shows the level he's at. Because people forget he's still the manager that brought us, brought us two WSL titles. Yeah. I think maybe that maybe that also is probably held against him. We well, did this, so why we got why we got the same now? It's not not quite. It's not the same squad. You yeah, know, it's, it's it also takes time completely to build time. Yeah, I mean the WSL is completely different. He might as well be in a in a completely different country in a different league. You yeah. know, from from what what ten years ago, it was just it was just a different era. Um, and and I think that's it. That's kind of what I what I mean in terms of the expectation. I think it's just, yeah, it's you, you can't just buy success overnight now, um, which you maybe no. could have done back in that time. So it's going to be a long process. We're not going to be in the Champions League next season. Um, so yeah, it's it's just it's it's a long process. And I think I think the first step, um, which was which was a big one on the return to WSL. I think the first step they they basically lapped it. You know, it was it was comfortable. So um, yeah. I've, I think he's done well. Excellent. So it is a World Cup year for those who don't know. Um, Aust- everyone's off to Australia. You're off to Australia. Yeah, fourteenth of July. So I'm running out of time to get everything ready. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But just give people a bit of preview. What you know, the games are on BBC and ITV, so free to air. So you know, it's making it again more access, so you know people can actually see the women's game. Yeah. Um, the England squad is very injury hit, so it's quite. <laughs> it's. I think I think they said from the starting eleven that won the Euros. I think over half have either retired in Ellen White's case or are out injured with ACLs. You know, the captain's out. Beth Mead, top goal scorer in the competition in the Euros, out. You know, Lucy Bronze is there, but you know has come back from quite a big knee injury. So it is quite a, a little bit of a new new looking. You know, Neve Charles has got herself back into the England squad. A former Liverpool player Laura Coombs, who's played very well for Man City, yeah. has got herself back yeah. into. Has got itself into the England squad. So, what we're sort of expecting from England because it's quite, it's probably not the the big thing under the Lionesses was that it was consistency in terms of selection because it was so good. I mean, the, I mean, listen, they're yeah. still winning games. Don't get me wrong, but this is quite a big change because a lot of probably the players were starting now would you would probably class as the, the change players if you know what I mean. Now they're the starters, yeah. so it's just a it's an interesting sort of it could be an interesting tournament for England. Yeah, absolutely. Like you're right in terms of like the, when when they won obviously Euro 2022 last year, it was the same starting eleven throughout the whole tournament, which has never actually been done in history. So it was very unique. And then obviously they went on a 30 game unbeaten run um, until they lost to Australia, which was only in April. So yeah, the injuries. Well, yeah, of course they play a part. I think England's strength is that the depth is so good that the players that they're bringing in are actually not a drop-off. So I don't really think, I mean, they are, but they're not a massive drop-off. I, I think the starting eleven is not actually really been massively affected. It's more the fact that because those bench players, as you say, have now become the starters, where's the bench? And I think that's that's the thing because yeah, you look, you look back at last summer and actually a lot of the success, it was the starting eleven would do their jobs 
And then you had the likes of Alessio Russo, Chloe Kelly and Ella Toon coming off the bench and mm. being those impact players. Now all three of them um, are probably going to be starting. Um, if not every game, then then obviously, you know, a fair few games. Um, so, yeah, who, who's going to be the players now that are going to step up off the bench? And there, there is some youth, there's some inexperience. Um, but it's yeah, there's there's no there's no shortage of quality. There's no shortage of talent in that England squad. It's absolutely bursting with it. Um, it's just whether or not they've got enough now about them, and whether or not Serena Wiegmann can can change things around. Um, but yeah, look, there's some really really tough competition in in, in this tournament, and uh, England's run to the final is uh, yeah is, is pretty tough. So, um, so if if England were to get to the final, what what sort of run are they looking at doing? So. It, they've got Denmark, China and um, Haiti in their group. So they're very, very strong favourites to top that group. Obviously, Denmark have got some 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 big players. So that won't be an easy game, but you would still expect England to win the group. Um, and then they could potentially face Australia in the last 16. So that's the hosts. Um, yeah, so that could be quite tough. Obviously, they've got Sam Kerr, um, best striker in the world. So, yeah, and that's that's England have obviously got injuries in defence. So that could be that could be a real a real sort of banana slip, banana skin one there in the last 16. And then if if they win that, then then there's a good chance that they could face Germany in the quarterfinals. Um, so personally, that's where I think England could could go out because I Germany am I uh, I'm predicting them to win the tournament. So yeah, I think I think it could be a really really tough really tough quarterfinal draw potentially. And we saw the Euros final how good that German side is. So good. So yeah. especially when they lost their best striker in the war ball. Yeah. Uh, which people forget for the finals, you know, she was top goal scorer with, with Beth Mead, top goal scorer in the tournament, and unfortunately for her, got injured in the warm up, which is a shame because she had a, tr- a torrid two years of getting herself fit for yeah. that tournament. So, so a Germany, so other than Germany, who who are the other ones to sort of look out for? Yeah, what do you think? Uh, the other side of the draw, um, which is looks like the much kinder side of the draw. Um, you've obviously got the USA who have won the last two World Cups. They're going for like an unprecedented third third win. Um, I, I I can see them getting to the final, um, and I don't think you can ever ever write off the USA. No. Um, they haven't got, got as many big superstars in in the team this year, but they've got some seriously seriously good young players, and they still have some some big some big players. So. Um, they've lost their captain as well, Becky Sowerbrand. She's out um, injured. That got confirmed this week, so that's a big blow to them. But yeah, I I personally think USA will be right up there, and I think they'll give uh, if Germany get to the final. I think USA will give them a good game. Um, and then you're looking at uh, you're looking at Spain, who um, I think nobody really knows what to expect from them because they've had a lot of issues with their federation. There's been a lot of players that um, have stepped out of the team over the last year. Um, so they are missing some big players, but then you look at their squad and they've still got the Ballon d'Or winner, um, Alexia Puteres, the best player in the world. They've got didn't she, didn't she miss the Euros as well with her injury? With an ACL, yeah. So that was literally on the eve of the tournament. She she did her mm. ACL. Um, so that's so she's a huge player for them. How fit is she going to be? Obviously, she's not really played this season. She's only come on as a sub in the last few weeks. So um, again, a bit of an unknown. But then they yeah they've got people like. Barcelona midfielder Eitana Bonmati, who I personally think is the best player in the world at the moment. Um, so yeah, they they they've got some real real talent. So you're looking at Spain, um, and then yeah, probably probably Sweden, who who've been there or thereabouts. I thought they were disappointing at the Euros, but again, they've got some good players. Um, and then yeah, the other one really is France. They they've got a bit of a tag of the the kind of the tournament. Um, yeah, the tournament fluffs really. They always seem to to blow it at, at tournament football because they've got some really, really good players as well. Mm. Obviously you look at um you look at Leon and PSG in terms of domestic football. Um they've had huge, huge success and they just haven't been able to translate translate that onto the world stage. So um if they can get them ticking under a new manager, um then France will be some team. I don't think anyone will fancy playing against playing against France. Cool. Right. So thanks for that ever. So well I think that's all for the season really now. So you know like big thanks to me from for Emma for doing a lot of these shows. Neil as well, who's currently enjoying himself in Glastonbury, and <laughs> Philippa and Philippa as well. So I'm um, hopefully we'll all get together again probably September time when we'll start talking about all these players Liverpool have bought and how we're going to win the PSL. That's pretty much how it works, isn't it? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks for having me on, Chris. I've really enjoyed it, and thanks to everyone for listening along. It's uh, yeah, it's it's great to always share our opinions with you, and yeah, hope you've enjoyed the season as much as we have. Yeah, before we go, Emma, where, if people don't know about it, where can people find you? 
Where can people find me? Everywhere. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm on Twitter, um, EM underscore Sandy with a Y, um, BBC Sport website. Um, where else can you find me? Probably a little bit on Five Live now and again as well. So, yeah, yeah there Keep you go. Your <laughs> Keep your eye out for Emma's article. She's far too modest to plug her own articles, but her articles are well worth a watch, especially if you want to learn about women's football, which is what I do. Um, and they're, they're really worth, <laughs> they're well worth a what, they're well worth a read, and you sort of pick things up from pick things up from there. That's what I do. Cool. But well, listen, thanks well, very much, Emma. <laughs> yeah. So thanks very much, Emma. I'll speak to you all very very soon.